Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, He takes Prophet Joseph, Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, through a roller coaster ride. From the very beginning, where he is separated from his beloved father. And who does it? I'm just running through the story. His own siblings, his own blood, they plot and plan against him and they separate him from his father. He's thrown into the bottom of a deep and dark well. He's transferred to another land. A caravan comes about and it's not a rescue mission. And he's a young boy at that time. He's not a uh, senior prophet, a young boy. This caravan, they don't come and they don't uh, rescue him and take him back to his father. But instead, they put him in shackles. They chain him up, throw him to the back of a caravan. And they travel to a foreign land. He was in Palestine. They take him to Misr, Egypt. And they sell him in those lands as a slave. Subhanallah. One day you're a free man and the next day you're a slave. Think about it. He's working in a house belonging to a minister. The wife of that minister tries to seduce him. And when she is caught, she turns the tables around and she blames him. He's an adolescent at that time and she blames him, saying that he was the one who tried to seduce me. Now obviously, to protect the name and reputation of that family, they decide to put him into prison. Unjustly, he was innocent, he was thrown into prison. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Yusuf, he remained in prison for many years. And then the king of the land witnesses a dream. Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam interprets the dream. It's a long story. Finally, he is now appointed as the minister of finance. He is released. His innocence is put out, is proclaimed. And now he becomes the minister of finance of Egypt. And then what happens? A famine, a drought hits the lands. And the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam themselves come to Egypt now seeking help and assistance. Yusuf والسلام, notices his brothers. They don't know that it is Yusuf, but he knows that it is them. And he also notices his younger brother, Binyamin, who was with them. A brother who was very close to Yusuf. And Yusuf والسلام, he misses his family so much, he misses his brother so much that he decides to somehow retain his brother back. So he uses a plan, he plots, and he executes his plan in such a way where there was an object, a royal object, in the sense, an object from the palace that was placed in the possessions, in the belongings of that young boy. And as the caravan was leaving, a caller calls out that something has been stolen of the king. We need to check your possessions. They check the possessions and they find the goblet or whatever it may be to be in the bags of Binyamin and that he has to be kept behind, subhanallah. Now this was the plan of Yusuf just to be united with his brother. Now he's kept behind, he introduces himself to his brother and the brothers, the other brothers who had plotted against Yusuf now they are wringing their hands because they don't know what to go back and tell their father. Years back they had to go and lie to their father and tell him that wolves had eaten Yusuf. And until today because of that, Yaqub is in sadness because of the loss of his son and now to go and tell him about the loss of another son Benjamin bin Yamin they're wondering what to do but nonetheless they go all the way back and they inform their father the minute they do Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam he cries out anhum. he turns away from them and he says and now the ayat come into context now that you know how the story is flowing now, I want you all to focus on this conversation. The topic for the sermon is sources of anxiety. Sources of anxiety. We're going to go into a few sources, inshallah. We're studying the sources to be able to equip ourselves on dealing with these sources, inshallah. What does he say at that point when he's informed that his son, his other son too, has been kept back? He says, Qala, Ya asafa ala Yusuf. Whoa. Alas, now this is a word in English that is not used these days. But in Arabic it's used to express sadness, grief, heartache. And he cries out the name of Yusuf. I want you all to analyze the discussion for a moment. 
the brothers Yusuf والسلام, went missing years ago the brothers are now coming to the father and telling him about the loss of Binyamin the father instead of now mourning the loss of Binyamin the father remembers Yusuf he cries out oh how I miss Yusuf now from this what do we understand that the father has not gotten over Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam as of yet. So many years have passed. But he still firmly believes that Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam is alive and that he will return. And then the brothers, they were also perplexed. They looked at the father and they say, You, what do they say in the ayah? They say, but Allah, you will never, you will never cease remembering Yusuf. You keep on remembering him and you will remember him until you become weak with old age or until you die. You can never get over this. You keep talking about Yusuf. Now this was a worry in the heart of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. And the minute the son said this, he went on to tell them, Qala innama ashku bathi wa huzni ila Allah. This is the ayah that we will be focusing on, Shah. He tells them, I'm only lamenting, I'm only putting forward my worry, my heartache, ila Allah, unto Allah. Yes, my heart is riddled with worry. Yes, I miss my sons. Yes, I miss Yusuf. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurt. But I'm not putting it forth unto you. I'm not putting it forth unto the creation. I'm putting it forth unto the creator. amri ilallah. I'm placing my affairs in the trust of my Lord. This is what I'm doing. And then he goes on to say, Inni a'lamu min Allahi ma la ta'lamun. Because at the end of the day, he was a prophet of Allah. He goes on to say, Indeed, I know from Allah that which you do not know of. I have inspiration coming from Allah. I have revelation coming from Allah that you know nothing of. So I am complaining. I am lamenting. I am turning. I'm putting forth all my worry, all my distress, all my pain unto Allah. Now this is how he managed his anxiety. This is how he managed his worry. This is how he managed his distress. But how are we doing it today? Firstly, we all have to acknowledge that we live in very trying times, anxiety filled times. You know why? As I was preparing the content for the sermon, I was reading a few articles, I watched a few videos on anxiety as well. And I gathered some content and I would like to share it with you all because I think it will be, be, it will be beneficial for myself firstly and then all of you all inshallah if you pay an attentive ear. Take an example. Let's say you, I'm sure most of us here we have been on safaris. Yes, we have been on safaris where you go, you know, perhaps jungles, forests, you see wild animals out on the loose. You get to witness beautiful and magnificent animals. You see the lions, the leopards, the, the, the cheetahs, the tigers and whatnot. So think of yourself being on a safari. And then what do you see? You see a giraffe. Beautiful animal, slender, long neck. And it's munching and chomping on some leaves. You are in the safari. You're looking and admiring this beautiful animal. And you're thinking to yourself, Wow, how carefree this animal looks. Doesn't have a worry in this world. And in all reality, it is the truth. Because animals, they live in immediate response environments. They live in immediate response environments. Let me explain. The giraffe, whenever it's hungry, it feels hungry, it goes by a tree and it starts chomping on the leaves, hunger goes away. When it hears a storm rumbling, it hears thunder, it witnesses lightning, 
it thinks it's going to rain I need to find shelter it goes finds shelter it's relieved when it spots a predator an animal that's looking to hunt it it immediately the flight or fight signals you know fire in its brain it runs for safety and once it's safe it's safe alhamdulillah so immediate response environments but we human beings we live in delayed response environments not immediate you know long long ago prehistoric man he lived in you know if you will immediate response environments but today we all live in delayed response environments how so today you're studying you're not going to see the results immediately you need to get your degree and you still don't know once you get your degree as to whether you would get a job and even if you get a job you don't know as to whether you'll be happy doing that particular job and you don't know as to whether you'll be paid well you don't know how life will turn out to be you don't know as to whether you'll buy yourself a house you don't know as to whether you can afford the vehicle that you're running in right now you don't know as to whether your business will run smoothly in this particular government or the next particular government delayed response and therefore the stress factors are chronic they're not short term for the giraffe it's short term you see anxiety is a natural response anxiety is a natural response just like depression is a natural thing you know if you read about depression when you're going through certain worries depression kicks in to numb your feelings for and it's supposed to be short term the minute it becomes long term then that's when it becomes chronic depression when you start feeling like you can't feel anything you don't feel happiness you don't feel sadness you're like a zombie then it becomes problematic Likewise, anxiety, look at the example of a deer, the deer in the jungle, it sees a lion, anxiety kicks in and you see the deer bolting and running away, it's startled and it runs away. You might have seen it in BBC documentaries and whatnot. But once the deer moves out of the, the radius, the perimeter, where the lion is going to attack, what do you notice the deer doing after that? Do you see the deer all stressed up and sitting in a corner, heart beating away, dub, 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 dub. Lion is gonna eat me, lion is gonna eat me, lion is gonna eat me. No. The deer goes to a corner and starts to graze like normal and it goes on with its life. It doesn't have, a, you know, chronic anxiety where it's constantly on pins and needles. The next time it spots another predator, again it runs. It goes to a safe haven. It goes back to its calm state. And this is how we're supposed to be, but we aren't that. We are constantly filled with anxious thoughts.